the songs that they're coming out with today, consisting of this, as an example, the Isaac singing songs like, I don't carry rocks in my pocket, because they might ricochet, you know, like throwing stones at somebody. But the whole idea is, basically, they don't want you to come against anything. What they really want to do, they don't want you to expose any of these false gods, any of these false teachings. They don't want you to expose anything. They're actually trying to dumb down our country so much that our school teachers, from what I could understand the kids told me, slinging water around in a glass and the glass going up on the side of the, the water going up on the side of the glass is supposed to be a sign of gravity in the glass, which is totally absurd. Maybe they're talking about uh, a force that would show gravity has been held on the earth or it would sling off. Maybe they're talking something like that. But anyway, if they're teaching this kind of stuff in our schools and they're starting to teach things that are totally against our education system, this is the Zionist-controlled country with Zionist-controlled education. And that's what it comes down to. So they want to take our country down. They got, you know, Common Core education. They got Common Core math. They have all of this. And I'm sure that, you know, they'll get down to it. <clears throat> you know, they use mental drugs. All that goes to Revelations 18.23. And sorcery is something that's running rampant through our country today. And it's running rampant through the Bible. You can see it in Acts chapter 13. You can see it in Acts chapter 8. Simon the sorcerer and his money that he controlled uh, people with. Sorcery and money. They're doing the same thing today with the airplane people and the lies they tell. It's the same deal. And then Acts 13, they have Elimus the, the, uh, the sorcerer. And he was a magician too. And uh, Paul cast his, a blind spell upon him because he was trying to stop the ways of the Lord. But it goes on to Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, and it shows you that this not only has happened all the way back in Egypt, but happens all the way down through the world and happens all the way to the book of Revelations till it's finished. Now, people that don't know this are just blinded themselves. They're kind of like I was. When we was kids, we'd be out smoking marijuana and something talk about Oh, that's witchcraft. We said, really, is there something really, is there real witchcraft? Is it real? <laughs> I mean, you know, we didn't know what witchcraft was. The church today is just as ignorant as I was. But you know, the Bible said that he's a devil in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that blinds the minds of people that believe not. Church people cut it off right there. They believe, oh, I believe in Jesus, so I'm free. No, that's when the battle begins. It's not free. You're not free. That means that you have been enlightened to the point that you know that there is a hell and that there is a son of God named Jesus Christ and that you can escape hell if you give your life to him. That's all that does. As far as learning more after you're born again, you've got to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 3 through 5 where it talks about casting down imaginations. If you don't believe in that, well, you're blinded really. I mean, you can look at that. so many scriptures in the Bible about mind control. You know, Ephesians 4, 17. Ephesians 4, 23. You know, those are ideas that you have to learn about walking in the vanity of your mind. The real Christians have to learn about their mind in order to actually be saved. If they don't learn about their mind, people wind up believing everything crazy. Okay, I'm going to show you something here where that all goes to. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the mind because we talk about that a lot, and I think it's a great subject. It's one of the major subjects of the Bible. But let's talk about Billy Graham. He says on the Internet, you can see him, he gets there with Robert Schuller, and he says... Oh, the body of Christ is so open. You don't have to believe in Jesus. You may not even know that you believe in Jesus, but you're in the body of Christ. Why would he say something like that? You don't even know that you believe in Jesus, 
So he wants people to believe they're walking down the street and say, yes, you believe in Jesus, you just don't know it. Why would he come out with something like that? He wants to pull everybody into ecumenicalism. An ecumenical movement means everybody comes into a global church. If you look it up in the dictionary, that's what it means. E-C-U-M-E-N-I-C-A-L, ecumenical. That's where they want to go. Like the big temple they've got down in Brazil, they don't believe in anything except the Jews run the temple. A rabbi comes in and people come from everywhere. They don't have a doctrine. You know, other than he read something out of the Old Testament, which they don't believe in the Old Testament anyway. But the idea is, if they can stop people like you and people like me, they got it made. There's nobody going to tell on them. Then everybody is ignorant. Everybody's afraid to say anything. You know, it's like they're putting fear in you. They want you to believe it's the Muslims. Oh, we're going to get you. You know, you're supposed to believe in the Muslims. You know, that's one thing they want you to believe. You're supposed to never mention these other fake religions like Mormons, Catholics. You're never supposed to tell them about Jack Van Impe, who's an obvious witch himself. I was amazed with that. I didn't know that Jack Van Impe was basically a witch. I didn't hear him say it on purpose, but apparently he's going all off the deep end and says that, uh, from what I read now on the internet about two months ago, he's, on the, he's saying himself that he'll never leave his Catholic brothers again. Which means he believes in Catholics who don't even have a Bible like ours. They don't believe in born again. They don't believe in the Bible. They believe in a lot of mythicism. And they believe in a lot of cartoons. We'll call it that, just like the Mormons. I don't want to go into what they believe because you should know that or you can study that on your own, but it's a scam. The Mormons are the scam. It's like a cartoon. If you're a good Mormon here, when you get to heaven, you can, you know, be a god too. You can be a god. You know, that's so ridiculous I wouldn't even talk about it. So let's go into the book of St. John. I want you to turn there with me and I want to talk to you about one of the most important subjects in this book. Perhaps the most important subject. Me and Michelle talked about it a little bit today. <clears throat> Some of the things that they do in this book, they want to stop you today from knowing anything about this book. The devil fought me studying this book so hard every morning that I have got up to study this book. God is my witness, man. The devil has hit my mind so hard. It's like trying to knock me out. I'm like, ah, oh. ah. Oh. I have to get up and bind that demon and get up and bind that demon. By the time 8, eight o'clock rolls around, I have to make me another cup of coffee. I have never seen anything in my life come against me like it has over this book of John. But I can understand why. I never knew that before. But I understand why because some of the most powerful cults in the world are into this. One of the most powerful cults I believe in America, and they keep raising these ministries up, see, like Mormons, or yeah, Mormons, that's one too, but like Muslims, they're against the Father and the Son. Allah has no sons. <clears throat> you know, they keep trying to come against Father who gave his only begotten Son. We've got some of the most important cults in this country because you've got the UPC. If you don't know what that is, that's United Pentecostal. They don't believe there is a Father. They believe that Jesus is the Father and he's the Son. Then you've got the oneness. The oneness believes in cartoon type stuff also. When I say cartoon, I mean they believe that Jesus plays two parts in the Bible. Actually, three parts. He's the Father, and He speaks from heaven, and then He's the Son, He prays in the garden, and then He's the Father again. That's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard in my life, but yet, you know how many denominations, or churches, I should say, 
that believe this? There's a lot of them. They had a big meeting up in Canada. I don't know how many people was in that meeting. This has been like 15 years ago. I don't know what it is, you know, today. I'd say there's more. But in this country, there's thousands of apostolic churches. Probably in every city. There's probably a thousand of them in Dayton. I wouldn't doubt it. I know there's several hundred. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't reach a thousand. So I'm going to bring you to some of the ideas in this book. And if you will go with me, you can learn something that's very important. One of the things that they do, and I'm going to tell you about this first, is they say, well, you know, Father is just a name, or is not a name, it's a title. That's one of the things they use. And in the book of John, the way they look at this, in the 17th chapter, he uses this word name, I think about three times. And why this is important, the 17th chapter is a prayer that Jesus prayed after his last teaching. He says in verse 6, I have manifested thy name, Father, is what he's saying. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now here's where that goes. If you look up the word name, it also is used as a symbol of authority. Okay? In this sense, the way they use it, they use it for authority. So, the disciples, at this point, apostles or whatever you want to call them, says, I have manifested thy name to men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me them, and they have kept thy word. So he has pointed them to the Father and showed them where Jesus received his power from. It's what it boils down to. In other words, he showed them where he got his power. Because all through this, he is so... <clears throat> so dependent on the Father through this book. He mentions it over a hundred times in the book of John. In the last five days, he mentions the word Father 49 times. So he's actually saying in verse number six, I have manifested thy authority to them. By him praying in the garden, by him praying here, and by all the works he did, he did it in the name of, of the authority of Father. That's what he did. If you look it up, it's one of the things, it's authority. So he taught the disciples where to get their power from. To give you an example, <clears throat> in chapter 16, the last teaching that he did to them, look at this last two verses in chapter 16 of St. John. He said in verse 32, he tells the disciple, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, and now is come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own. He'll be alone, and shall be, leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So now notice how he teaches them here to draw nigh to the Father. He says in verse 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that you may, that you might have peace. He said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But he's telling them, I'm not alone. Look at that verse 33, the Father is with me. You see this? This is very important. He teaches that all through this book, how the Father is with him. 
If you look at the word alone, you can pick it up on your strongs and you can see what he's saying, how the Father never left him. That really touched me because he tells the disciples in John 12, he said, I go to do the will of the Father. He says, and uh, you know, I'm not alone. The Father is with me. I'll be left alone. He tells them all of this. As an, as an example, they would suffer being alone. That's what he tells them when they'll be scattered. Look what it says in chapter 15, verse 18 through 21. This is kind of amazing too. He said, you're going to be hated. He said, you're going to be hated if you were of the world. The world loves his own, but because you're not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world is going to hate you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, and if they've persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. One of the problems that the apostolics has got for people that's got education, they give you all this information, but they never mention a root word. Not one time in all of their teaching. Simply because they can't support what they say. The word sent in verse 21 has that idea of a mission to be accomplished. God has sent him on a mission. Now, if you look at this, <clears throat> all the way through 21, 18 through 21, they're going to be scattered, they're going to be rejected, and if you go back with well, me now to the last of chapter 16, he tells them, and yet I am not alone in 32 because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken unto you, and he's given himself as an example that you might have peace. Now notice this, they can have peace, and you see how they're going to hate them, but the thing about it is, if you know that you're, if you don't have the Father with you of God, I mean, there's times we all go through things when you wonder, where is God? Why is he not with me? You know, I feel like I'm so alone. I feel like sometimes I'm by myself. Everybody's had them feelings. I'm well, backslid. God, what's wrong? You know, I don't really feel God. But he's saying, in the world you have tribulation. And this is what they're going to do to them, and they do it to us. But be, good, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So what he's really saying is what Melanie was talking about, abide in him. Because if you don't abide in the spirit of God, you can't stay there. One of the biggest things that you learn about this whole teaching in the book of John rests upon Matthew 27, 52. You want to see that? This is one of the greatest revelations that I think you can get. Boy, the devil does not like this revelation. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the last of that 17th chapter in a minute, and I'll show you where this goes. Matthew 27, 50, 51 and 52. Jesus had cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves. And after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, the, enemy, the centurions, they did quake, and in the last of verse 54, it says, truly, they said this was the Son of God. Now, if you don't know what the veil means, let me give you an example here, and I'll uh, let you see it for yourself so you can see what this refers to, because if you look at the veil, the book of Hebrews is the best place to teach this, you see it in chapter 6 of Hebrews 19. Look what it says. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Within the veil. Listen to this now. Chapter 9. And after the second veil, tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. This is where they went in behind the veil but what happened is, look right here in verse 
51, I think it is, or 50, it says the veil, when Jesus gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple actually ripped itself apart. So it says in chapter 10, verse 20, it's a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. So the flesh represents his body. Have you got that? In other words, the flesh is his body, and what we do, we enter into his body. Now, why is this so important? I won't go into these three names three times in this chapter 17 that he uses the word name, but <clears throat> let's look at this real closely. <clears throat> In, in 17th chapter, look at verse 11. And now I'm no more in the world. Now he's getting ready to see to be, go into the garden after this chapter where they take him capture, captive. Now all mine are thine, he says in verse 10, and all mine, and I'm glorified in them. Now in verse 11, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Okay? Look in verse 20, chapter 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their preaching that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and the world may know that thou hast sent me, and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Now, this gives you the idea, what do we as Christians do every day? We try to be like Jesus, amen? That's what we do. You look at the thing they want to tell you, he tells Philip, if you go back, he says, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because he said, I go, Philip. I got to go. And I'll see you in a little while and you shall see me no more. Where are you going? Well, the idea was that Jesus is already like the Father. He is so much like the Father that he says in John 8, 20, uh, 827 or 828. These are scriptures that he says there. I only, let's read that. In John 8, I'll show you why he's, he's like the Father. This is what he teaches all through this book. And this is why it's such a powerful book. I and mean, we'll get better at it as we go. Verse 29, 28 of John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, he says, And he, Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. He says in verse 38, I speak the things which I have seen in my Father, and he tells the Jews, and you do that thing which you've seen of your father. So this is very apparent that Jesus has a father, but the father taught him, and this is where we're at today. God is teaching us, and if you become like Jesus now, and you're obedient, you enter into his flesh, and that's why, how we get into the body of Christ. In other words, he opened up the body of Christ when he died. So you go in the body, you're a believer, you're, a, you're in the body of Christ, then you're righteous like he's righteous. So you abide in him and you stay righteous before the Father. If you go look this up a little bit closer, 
it's not hard to find it because to find out what it actually means, we're all one with him right now. We're in the Father because we're in Jesus. Jesus is in the Father, we're in the Father. He says, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. They use that too. That's why he's the Father, because no, no, that means that Jesus was like him, and that's what we're trying to do, and anybody that can't see that, you're not very much of a Christian. We work every day to become like God, to get the flesh out of the way, amen? That's what we do, fasting and praying, programming our mind, memorizing his word, and that's what Jesus said. He said, I want to do that which I see my father do, that God had taught him. So you working every day to be one with Christ Jesus is what it's all about. See, if, you, if you're not like Jesus, it's because, well, you're not in the body. If you're in the body of Christ and you learn to watch your mouth, now we all make little mistakes. How many of y'all know what the holiest place is? In the body, right? It's what he teaches. So we all make a little mistakes, but that's what the trespass offering is. We make mistakes, we ask God to forgive us, and that's what it's all about. So you can look here, each time in John's Gospel, chapter 17, you use the word name, it's always talking about his authority. And he's teaching the disciples who to call on, where he draws his strength from. And he said, if you abide in me, he said, fine, you're going to overcome tribulations. If you get out of me, you're not going to overcome them. He said, the world's going to hate you, but stay in me. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. He said, I spoke these things that you don't get depressed, that you don't get discouraged. They're going to throw you out of the temples. You know, they're going to kill you, basically, some of them. But the whole idea is that he says those things because he's telling them and warning them, stay in God. If you don't stay in the Spirit, you can't serve the Lord. You get caught up in yourself. You get caught up in the world. And I don't care who you are. You're not that good. Amen? You've got to stay in the Spirit. And you've got to walk with the Lord. So the whole ideal of Christianity rests upon the ideal of them taking these things out of context. Because not many people can even tell you what the veil is. Let alone tell you that, that we go there in the body of Christ. That's what makes us one with Him. Because if we're in Christ, what does that tell you? We're one with him, amen? So this is where the whole idea goes, and very few people understand this. I don't know, I've never heard anybody into it before. But it's apparent when you get really deep into this book of John. You know, I, I look at this in verse 24 of John 17. There, every verse in here is good. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now look at this. If Jesus was the Father, how could he say that God loved him before the foundation of the world? See, this is like the 13th verse of Daniel chapter 7. It shows you clearly that there is a Father. And the word in John 3, 17 said, God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. So the word sent there, it goes to that mission word again. God sent him on a mission. Now in this chapter 17... He completes his mission. Look what he says here in chapter 17, verse 1. These words Jesus spake, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as, as thou hast given him, and that his life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now this thing here, this word sent is the same word they had up in John 3, 17, which talks about the mission. 
Now look what he said in verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work what thou gavest me to do. That's very plain, isn't it? I mean, this is so plain for these guys to try to twist the Bible around and they've been so successful with it because they've got a lot of demons working with them with witchcraft and mind control. Thou gavest me to do. He said, I finished it. Now, Father, verse 5, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Do you see this? Here it is again. It's not only verse 24, but it's also right here in 17.5. He had the glory with him, with the Father before the world was. But see, they don't want to deal with these kind of things and they don't want to go into root words. They don't want to bring it out. They, they actually do like, like the Union Assembly Church of God they had down in Dalton, Georgia. I had a cousin got into that. You know, that is so ridiculous, them telling you that, oh yeah, the devil came over on the ark with Noah. And you know, it was a dog. That's why it don't mention that in Scripture because you know it talks about dogs. And he was a dog. They called him a dog. So he came over with the animals. This is a pretty big denomination. They got that denominations from what I read about them in Europe and got a lot of them throughout the South. Union Assembly, Church of God. It's a cult. And you know, my cousin was with them. One of the preachers had her pregnant when she was 16 years old. I don't know how old he was, but much, much older. So the idea that we are struggling today because people are ignorant. They don't know how to study. The demons fight their mind with the Bible. They can't really study because a lot of them don't know how to cast down evil spirits of mind control. I believe that's the biggest thing there is. I don't believe they even know how to study. But if they did, the biggest battle is yet to come. They've got to learn how to take control over the minds of demons. Cast these devils down. They've got to learn how to use the power that God gave them. Most of them, I heard Jimmy, uh, James Robinson, back in the 70s, he was over at the University of Dayton when they built it. And he says, oh, you can't cast out no devil. Ain't nobody but God can cast out a devil. Real ugly, you know, real mean like he said that stuff. And them little Baptist people, they didn't know what to say. You know, they're just like, the pastors brought their churches over there. That's how they filled up the University of Dayton Arena. So they had a lot of them. I was there, you know. I heard him. And you know, we thought he was, you know, I mean, they had all them people there and he preached to them and we did get some people down at the altar that give their life to God. People brought their family members in there that's unsaved. But you know, at the end of the day, people don't understand how to cast out devils. Their mind is never going to be free. You have to learn to take authority over them in the name of Jesus. Amen? Now, one of the things that we ask Jesus said, glorify thou me that I might glorify thee, Father. In what way do you believe that Jesus is going to glorify the Father? If you go back through the scriptures, you see that in the gospel scheme as a whole. That's one way. Because all through the gospel scheme, Jesus, he created the worlds and everything. God had him to do this. But there is an ancient of days... That's not Jesus. He's the Son of God. And so, you look at the gospel scheme and you find out that Jesus, God gave His only begotten Son, and every place in the book of John, you can find that Jesus is talking about Father, Father, Father. I mean, He goes on and on and on. There's so many of them. And you know what touched my heart really about some of them, but... He kept saying, like he did in John 8, he says, you know, my father's never left me alone. They come to him and they says, the testimony of one man is not true is what it says in the scriptures. In the mouth of twos and threes shall every word be established. And you glorify your own self. Jesus said, if I did glorify myself, it'd be true. But you know what? I've got one that glorified 
me and the Father, and he's with me. <laughs> I thought that's pretty cool. He got him. One, no matter what he went through, you know what he always said in the scriptures, the Father had never left me alone. And you look at the ideal of following, for us to follow the footsteps of Jesus, it's so heart touching. I mean, to know that everything you go through, God is never going to leave you. And he's got such power in your prayers, how he answers your prayers. Jesus kept saying in the scriptures, anything you ask the Father in my name, he said, I'll do it. I mean, that is a pretty good piece of action right there, isn't it? 14, 13, that's how also the Father is glorified in the Son. The Father is glorified in the Son. Is what now? Is, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. <clears throat> so that's John 14... 13 and 14, it talks about the Father's glorified in the Son because we pray in the name of Jesus to the Father. I mean, that's really cool. You know, we pray to, Jesus, to God, the Father, in the name of Jesus, and that glorifies the Father. So that's not the only place. He uses, like I said, the Father, the word Father, 104 times, and... You know, you only got how many chapters in John? What are we, 21 chapters? That's it. Is it 20 or 21? 21. I thought it was 21. So you know, 21 chapters, that's five times in every chapter or more that he uses the word Father. This book is totally packed with the ideal of a God who gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you find out that it's so amazing how they've been so successful in raising up all of these churches that don't even believe in the Father. How did they do that? The idea that they have did this through mind control. They did this with sorcery. They did it with witchcraft. And you know what? They're not going to stop. The devil is working witchcraft today. I told them before. I tell them again. Look. Weapons of mass destruction, they come from propaganda. Weapons of mass destruction, that is the devil using propaganda over this whole country and over the whole world. Got people, everybody believing, oh yeah, we better get those guys in Korea. You know, they're, they're just shooting bombs off everywhere. Ain't nobody seen no Korea shooting no bombs. You understand what I mean? Ain't nobody seen that. It's a bunch of propaganda. That's what war propaganda is all about. They want the whole country to support what they do, so nobody, everybody in the country said, no, we're not doing that. Well, obviously, they'd have a hard time. But anyway, the whole idea is that we're serving a God that's alive and well, and he now is the, holds the position in heaven as what? If he was father, <coughs> and if he was the father, and he was also the son, do you think he would hold the position in heaven according to Hebrews chapter 7? Do you think he would be the high priest of heaven? Not if he's the father and the son. You know, if he's holding the, high, the position of Hebrews chapter 7, he's the high priest that sits on the right hand of God and, you know, he intercedes for them. See, he evermore maketh intercessions for us is what it says in John chapter 8. I think it is, what is it, verse 37 to 38? He evermore maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So, you know, this gives you the plain presentation of Jesus Christ. But we are in a battle today. They've created so many ministries that's against our Bible. I mean, think about it, man. You've got the seventh day. We're not supposed to know what that is. We're supposed to be stupid. But they're one of the richest things. It's another Catholic church kind of, you know, deal. You know, you know, oh no, we're on the seventh day. We worship there. You know, it's, they're rich. They're the people. They're Jews. 
33rd degree Masons, they're Jewish. You find out all of these things. Where you think that the Mormons came from, they're rich, they're the Jews. I mean, they fund them, and I'm not saying they are Jews because they're not, but they fund them. That's what the whole thing is. So you say Jehovah's Witness, where did they come from? Well, all of those guys, a lot of them came from the 1800s. Yeah, they've been made up. They've been made up with sorcery. They've been, you know, inspired by demon spirits. And one of the things that is a problem, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to tell you how important this is. 2 Corinthians 11. Look what it says. In verse number 2, he says, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. Jealousy. He says, I have espoused or married you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin. He said, but I'm afraid lest that by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. And he called it simplicity because you don't need anything but your faith and submission. It's so simple. But he says, for if that for if he that cometh preach another Jesus whom I have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received from us, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. The whole idea is that you will have a hard time getting people delivered from a religious spirit because those spirits are mind blinding, they're very powerful, they control you, and they will not let you go. These are the hardest things you've ever done where you're trying to win somebody from a Catholic church or trying to win somebody from a Mormon. Oh, they're coming against you, coming against your God. That's coming against God. They just don't know who we are. You know, they're the Catholics and we're the Protestants. Oh, we're, per yes, we're, we're really protesting against them. This is just a, a, a bunch of sorcery, mind-controlling spirits that you're not going to get people free very easy once they get into these religions. That's why that we need to get them from their youth. And this is what they're doing to us today. They want our children from our youth. They don't want to get them when they're older. It's too late then. Once they get a demon in them, once they get to believe in all of this trash, you know, that the earth is round and gravity is, you know, uh, just seen with peop things that fall to the earth. And, you know, all they, they get that into people. It's sad. Because, you know, once they do that, they twist the people up and they twist their minds up and it's just a sad deal. But if you look at this very closely, once you get into a cult religion, C-U-L-T, you're jumping in bed with demon spirits. That's all it is. Once you get demon spirits in you, you know, you're probably not going to be free. You want to know the truth? How many people do you know that are, have been freed from one of these cults that we're mentioning? See, if they can stop this kind of preaching by throwing rocks, and if they can make you just to, oh, love everybody. You're not supposed to judge people. You just love everybody. <clears throat> now, the word one, O-N-E, 1520 in your strong. Let's talk about that for a minute. O-N-E. The word one. People hardly kind of get into this. I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about it before. But it don't matter. We're kind of different in everything we do. 1520. Cursed 272 times in the New Testament. And if you look at this closely, <clears throat> sometimes it's not as obvious as other times. Uh, as an example, in the book of 
Ephesians. It's mentioned 12 times. In the book of John, it's mentioned three times 12, 36 times, if I remember right. You find in Ephesians 2.14 hath made both one. Okay, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. See the word one? 2.15, have it abolished in his own flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances for to make in himself one of twain, of two, which is Jew and Gentiles, one. New man, one new man. Who is the new man? Jesus Christ, right? So we're in the body. That's what this is, means. In chapter 2, verse 18. For through him we both have access by one, one spirit, that's in the Jesus Christ, unto the Father. Both have access to the Father through this one. So here again is another good scripture for the Father. Ephesians 4, 4, there's one body, and that's the body of Christ. Even as ye are called in one. Hope, that one there is not the same one. That's 3391. And you're calling. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. One God and Father of all, who is above all. All of these scriptures here, you're looking at Ephesians 4, 7, Ephesians 4, 16, Ephesians 5.33 Nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as he has loved himself. That's a commandment for those that are in the body of Christ is why they use that. So that's why it's saying that. So it's, it's pretty obvious that this word one, one new man, one body in Christ Jesus, that's where it all goes. So people that want to come against the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and oh, that's this and that. It's nothing but a demon-controlled cult group that are preaching this. I had a guy to tell me the other day, he said, oh, uh, I was at this meeting and they preached like a man from another planet. They really get anointed. You would really be faked out tricked out. Let's talk about this just a little bit more. My time's running out. So I want you to look at 16. John 16. Go with me to verse 12. 12 through 15. I want to show you something. I think you'll like this. <clears throat> we have really fought battles since I've been a Christian. It's been tough. He says here in verse number 7, he said, if I don't depart, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you, and where he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you see me no more. So they have to receive the Spirit if they're going to be saved. And of judgment because the prince or the devil has been judged and found guilty. And he's the God of this world. Now look what it says in verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come, and he will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and show it unto you. I look at the Spirit here, he speaks of himself. Now notice where this is, this is pretty cool. 
I can't tell you too much about this because the root words don't really match up where I want them to. <laughs> so I have to kind of be careful of this where I go. But the Holy Spirit speaks of Jesus, right? He don't speak of man. He don't speak of flesh. What about the prophecies you hear that's always about this ministry? Excuse me. I could show you some of them that it's always the same prophecy, same little group, same little stuff. Supposed to be the Holy Spirit speaking what he hears. I kind of doubt that. Let's take this another step farther. What if you have people that claim to have the Holy Spirit, but they don't have the fruits to back it up? They claim they're anointed. They claim they're Christians. They claim to have the Holy Ghost. But what about the Holy Ghost? How many of y'all know that it takes a person that has some special specific fruits to be a Christian. Amen? If you don't have specific fruits in your life, what are the fruits? If you don't have a Bible, some of them don't even have a Bible. Some of them haven't even opened it in years. I don't even know where Matthew is. They're supposed to be saved, what, 49 years, some of them. That tells you what their church is like because those are leaders in the church. You look at this so obviously stupid. They don't have a prayer life. But yet, how do they shake the body? Huh? How do they shake the body? How is it they can shake and fall over the floor and jump up and down and all of this and claim to have all of this anointing and they don't even have a prayer life? You can't hold them a gun on them and get them into a prayer meeting. They don't do that. They don't really have the ideal of listening to Jesus. He said, my sheep, in John 10, my sheep know my voice. You have John, 1 John chapter 3. I think around verse 6, 7. He says this, they that are of God, they hear us, amen? What happens when they don't hear us? If we're speaking and we're preaching the scriptures. But yet they're supposed to be of God. They're supposed to be so greatly anointed. And oh, they're too anointed to be around us. We're just blockheads. Of course, they don't know anything about Scripture. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't even know how to look something up. How did they get saved? We hear them tell it. They've been saved about all their life. They never had a day when they got saved. It's just always been there. You believe that, you'll believe anything. This tells you, it tells you what we're dealing with. We got spirits that shake the body. We got spirits that tell you that Jesus is not the Christ. Spirits that tell you Jesus is not the Son of God, He's the Father. God told me on the phone, He said, look brother, we, we now are not like a lot of those apostolics. We're not one of them. Because we believe you're saved too. Wait, wait. Beep, 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 beep. Hold on. How are you going to believe that I'm saved when you just said that you're serving a Jesus that is the Father and the Son? He thinks that makes it all right. How many of y'all know just because you believe we're saved also makes you stupider than you are? How can you be telling somebody they're saved if you believe that Jesus is the Father and you're telling me that I believe that Jesus is the Son? One of us is wrong. One of us goes to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. If you believed in this other Jesus whom you have not received by our preaching, what have you done? You've got another Jesus. You might well bear with him. Somebody is wrong and somebody's going to hell. <clears throat> so you know how you're going to tell me, oh yeah, I believe, we believe other people say we're not like them. Here's my Holocaust card. I mean my saved card. Yeah, what is it? Christian card. Yeah, I've got my Christian card. Sit right here, I'm a Christian. The whole idea is that this is their really... 
it's their way of getting to uneducated people that don't know anything about the Bible. Amen? It's because you believe other people are saved too that don't make you a righteous person. If you're preaching one Jesus and I'm preaching another Jesus, one of us is going to hell. One of us is a witchcraft worker. And you know what? I've got the whole Bible with me. You can't show me one place where they're right. They want to tell you, oh, we believe that you're saved too, so yes, we believe that Jesus is the Father. And they actually had the audacity to write this stuff down on a note and say that, oh yeah, he wanted me to give you this literature and he said, you, I, he said but I believe it was God that wants you to know this. I wanted to write him back and tell, tell him, you little witch, you need to shut up. But I didn't do it because I want to be a nice guy. Matthew 11 28, 29, and 30. For I'm meek and lowly. You find rest into your soul, for I'm meek and lowly. So I want to be meek and lowly. How many of y'all want to be meek and lowly? You have to deal with some of these cults if you're going to be an effective Christian and a minister in these days. So one thing about it, we stay humble. The word lowly means that we're a lowly person. Condescend to men of low estate. Mean that one of the things that we love the little normal Average people, Christians, amen? We don't take those wise men from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3. All of those wise men in chapter 3, we'll let them go on. We love the little people, amen? Simple people and people that's got too much education, too much knowledge for us, we'll let them go. You know, you can go ahead on. I just love the little people, amen? I don't have it in my heart to be the big wise man. So that's kind of where that goes. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. Our Bible is consistent. It teaches the same thing all the way through the scriptures. So you know, it's obvious that a lot of people don't know anything about the Bible. They wander into these churches. You know, they get saved. Their family's been in them. Maybe they get saved according to them. But really they receive a demon and they get under a spell. That's all it boils down to. Because it's another Jesus, and he said you have to bear with him. That means you'll put up with him because you're not going to get delivered from him. I mean, it takes a very, very, very dedicated person to get delivered from one of them demons. And I've never seen it happen as I can remember of, but I know it's possible. Let's all stand. Lord, we just thank you right now. We give you praise, Father. We ask you, Lord, to make us a good witness. And Lord, I pray you'll take the words that we preach, Father, and help us to get them together even better next time. God, that we can bring this out and make it plain to every person. That, Father, we make it very plain, that everybody would understand it. We'd make it simple, as Paul said, Christ is. Christ is not hard, Lord. It's the law of faith and submission humbleness. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. We give you praise. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the Holy Ghost flood every soul here tonight. Flood their minds, flood their hearts. We bind the spirit of witchcraft. We cast you out, devil. And Father, we break every curse by the way of radio, by the way of television, in the name of Jesus. And God, I praise you for it. Everybody said? Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. All right.